This week on Animal Miracles, a 10,000 pound elephant held captive for more than 35 years is accused of killing her zookeeper. Everyone in the zoo knew that you don't push Sissy to go in the barn because she was very afraid to be forced into her barn. Only a miracle can save her in this tragic and touching story of love and understanding. Then, a mother and three children are helplessly lost in the treacherous Rocky Mountains, and only the miraculous skills of Grizz, the Wonder Dog, can save them from certain death. But first, a long-distance trucker faces a brutal assault on a lonely highway. There was a guy next to me in the truck stop. He said something about me giving him some money or loaning him some money or something like that. And uh, next thing I know, there's two guys standing there, one come out from underneath the trailer. But the miraculous courage of his constant companion proves that dogs truly are a man's best friend. These stories and more this week on Animal Miracles. Dogs' senses of smell and hearing are legendary, and we've taken advantage of those abilities for centuries. Dogs can be relied upon to hear intruders and even sniff out explosives with uncanny reliability. But what other senses do our canine companions possess? Insight? Even perception? In our next story, we'll meet a dog who exhibits a remarkable and largely unexplainable power, the power to save lives instinctively. Parents often boast about their children, and pet owners are sometimes guilty of the same affliction. Herb Blish is a trucker, and wherever he goes, so does his Rottweiler, Mariah. Rottweilers have been maligned as aggressive dogs, a reputation they really don't deserve. For 10 years now, Diane Richardson has been breeding Rottweilers. A great many Rottweilers, including a lot of mine, are real friendly on first contact. It's not typical of the breed. But they're not supposed to be aggressive either. They're not supposed to go out and attack people random. Um, they're just supposed to be sturdy, stable dogs that just aren't necessarily all over everybody. <laughs> Diane's devotion to the dogs includes working hard to ensure they only go to people who will care for them. Somebody said, there's a woman up in Springfield that sells Rottweilers, but it's, it's tough with her. You've got to sign a contract. She wants to make sure this and that, and I'm sitting there going, well, that tells me that the breeder is concerned about her animal. She wants to make sure it's taken care of properly. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Give me a call. Let me know how things are going. we Will do. Right. The goal is to place a dog in a forever home where they'll do something wonderful, and the people will love them forever, and she's done it. And Herb's never going to get rid of her now. That's how Herb Blish became a proud new pet owner, complete with bragging rights. Miracles can happen anytime, any place, even on America's seemingly endless ribbons of highway. I've hauled reefer trailers, dry box trailers, flatbeds, um, hauled a livestock trailer once, and promised never to do that twice. I've been to all 48 states. I've been into Old Mexico once. I've been to every Canadian province. Basically every large city, some small towns, places I probably will never see again. As a truck driver, Herb crisscrossed the nation countless times, mile after mile. Herb's constant companion and protector was Mariah. It was a Sunday afternoon. Uh, it was one of the larger truck stops in the country. I always parked to the backside, let her out and run around and stuff like that before I go inside. Herb and Mariah didn't realize that quiet Sunday afternoon that they were about to face the greatest challenge of their lives together. Mariah 
I was new to the tractor and still had the old habit of locking everything up before I left. Windows down, but I locked the doors. Truck drivers get robbed every day out there, and uh, you just, you gotta be safe. Went inside, got a meal. You know, I know drivers had been out there 15 years, never had to. I know drivers have been out there three months and been robbed. Uh, it's one of those things that's out there. It's bound to happen sooner or later if you don't watch yourself. And my big lesson was just because it's Sunday afternoon um, doesn't mean that it's not going to happen. Nighttime truck driver takes precautions. You, you look around your truck before you get near it. You look under it. Make sure there's nobody standing between the trailer and the tractor. But it was Sunday afternoon. Didn't pay it no mind. Just walked up to the truck. There was a guy in the park next to me in the truck stop. He said something about me giving him some money or loaning him some money or something like that. And I just kind of laughed it off. Yeah, right. You see, like, all National Bank tattooed on my forehead. And uh, next thing I know, there's two guys standing there. One come out from underneath the trailer and says, no, you don't understand. You're giving us your money. Oh, I think you heard me. It's a narrow area between the trucks. And with two of them, I knew if I could keep one in front of the other, they were, I was really going to only have to deal with one. You got some money for us? And I said, it's not going to happen. I don't it's, think so. This isn't an easy hit. It's just not going to happen today. It's already happened. As the two thugs menacingly moved toward Herb, one more moved to cut off any means of escape. I wasn't going to let my guard down, and, and they weren't giving up. Mariah was growing increasingly more agitated. Mariah could sense that Herb was in serious danger, and she would have to act now. She decided it was time to even the odds. I heard a yelp, a growl, and a third guy hollering, he's got a Rottweiler. I just out of the corner of my eye looked down and I've got Mariah sitting next to me, the fat end of a bat in her mouth, a wooden bat. And she's nudging me in the stomach with it, like, would this be some help? Uh, you need this? And I looked over my shoulder to see what was going on behind me. The third person was running. I had to kind of wiggle the bat to get it out of Mariah's teeth. She had a bite on it. She wasn't about to give it up to nobody. And when I grabbed the bat, the other, they turned and ran. Right after it happened, I went and brought them the bat and showed them what had happened. But a lot of states have Hello? weird laws about Rottweilers Hello? and pit bulls and stuff like that. So I explained to them what had happened and then left. Well, Herb called me from the road and um, told me all about it. He was very proud of her. And I was particularly pleased that she hadn't bitten anybody, that she had just assisted in scaring them off, which was all she needed to do because the dogs are supposed to react according to the situation at hand, and the situation didn't require her biting anybody, and she didn't. Yeah, the window was seven feet off the ground, and she had to go straight to the ground. She couldn't go out, she had to go down. The, the landing she made would probably have been something to see. Even though she got hurt on the way down, uh, her priority was the owner's in trouble, daddy's in trouble, we're gonna solve this problem first. If Mariah hadn't been there, I'd have been beat up pretty bad before it was over. I had pretty much no doubt in my mind on that. Being a puppy still and knowing that I was in trouble, actually before I knew I was in trouble, and to take the initiative to do something without a command. And I guess the miracle is that she did it without a command, but didn't go overboard. She just did what it took to defuse the situation and not go beyond it. And uh, I guess that's the miracle in itself.
Stay with us for more miraculous stories when a heavy set family dog proves to be worth her weight in gold by foretelling a potential tragedy. Sugar smelt the wire burning 10, 15 minutes before it ignited. Next on Animal Miracles. Genetic evidence suggests that we began domesticating dogs nearly 100,000 years ago. At first, most dogs were large and powerful workers who performed important tasks during the hunt or near the farm. Today, miniature and toy breeds are popular dogs for city dwellers. And in this story, we'll see that very small dogs are capable of extremely large acts of bravery and intelligence. They say good things come in small packages. For Elmas and Carolyn Watson, the best thing that ever happened to them was Sugar, a small dog who seemed to get bigger every day. When it came to devotion, Sugar had an especially big heart. Sugar was a very intelligent dog. She had a sixth sense that was unbelievable. She sensed danger. She insisted on getting attention. She had a habit of sitting back on her hind paws and could sit there for five to six minutes. Just sitting there, looking at you, begging for something to eat. Well, at first she would eat just anything, even jalapeno pepper. She would eat a jalapeno pepper and then run over and get her a drink of water and then go back and get some more. Onions, tomatoes, lettuce, salad dressing, peanut butter, just everything. But Sugar had more than just an appetite for food. She loved life and she was devoted to the people who cared for her. Once uh, I had emptied an ice tray when the uh, ashes were not all dead and they emptied it into a garbage can then close the lid. I suppose she smelled the smoke, but I didn't. I don't have a good sense of smell. Anyone could know that she had a, uh, a sense of danger. Well, she was devoted to me and Carolyn both. She loved us. She just sensed that this was her job, this was her house, and she took care of what she had to take care of because she knew we, take, we took care of her. Then another time, uh, there was a candle lit on the uh, coffee table, and I didn't realize that. Elmas had, had uh, lit it, and then I put a newspaper down, and it caught fire, caught the coffee table on fire. And she barked about that and alerted us to the danger. Sugar had saved her family twice, but she wasn't counting. One night, she proved that she still had heroism to spare. After I went to bed that night, Sugar came up into my room, and she started waking me up at 3 a.m., and usually that's my best sleep time. Sugar would uh, come from one side of the bed to the other, and kept bumping me and bumping the bed until, and she did bark a couple of times. With what amounted to a superhero effort, for a larger-than-life dog, Sugar leapt up on the bed. So I finally got up because she, I knew that, she, knowing Sugar, that she meant something was, something was wrong. So I said, I might as well get up and check the house. Sugar had done things before, but I knew that something was, something was wrong somewhere. I came to the front door and I checked, opened the door and didn't see anything outside. I checked all the rooms in the house. I looked at the plugs in the biggest part of the house. I didn't sense any fire or anything, so I went to Carolyn's room because she has health problems and, and um, just stayed in there with her. I laid on the bed. And I had been lay, lying next to Carolyn. 10 minutes and the heater started sizzling, the electrical cord threw fire out, it lit the room up. I, I didn't smell anything in the house, I didn't sense anything particular, but sugar more than likely smelt the wire burning 10, 15 minutes before it ignited. And it popped real loud. And, and, uh, 
sparks and fire shot out the wire. I immediately went and jerked the wire out from the wall, and the fire went out. She didn't run away because she wanted to save us. She was uh, very uh, loving to us and wouldn't have wanted anything to happen to us. When we went downstairs to have her coffee and everything, she come and she wanted her reward. She knew she was, she knew she was a super dog. She, and so uh, I fixed her a little snack too. Told her good girl, you know, had a girl. Sugar has passed on now, but her memory still holds an enormous place in Elmas's heart. I miss the dog. I mean, I'm, I miss that girl like a member of the family. You know. Uh, probably eventually I'll get another one, but right now I'm just, I'm still in a grieving, you know. I feel that she was a guardian angel in, in warning us about danger. I was grateful to Sugar again for having saved us. For Carolyn and Elmas, Sugar's love was proof that miracles come in all shapes and sizes. Coming up next on Animal Miracles, barrel racing is a fast, dangerous, and grueling sport. Meet the tiny young girl set on overcoming blindness to realize her destiny in the saddle. She has control of a 1,500-pound animal, and she is free, and I think that helps her spirit. Stay with us. Animal Miracles will continue. Humans harnessed the horse as a pack animal, but our most profound connection came nearly 6,000 years ago when we first began horseback riding. Horses were once our primary mode of land transportation, but technology has relegated the proud horse to pet status in most of the modern world. In our next story, we'll meet a group of people who have found a new and remarkable use for horses, one which may be as important as the role they played in the lives of our ancestors. Barrel racing is a sport that requires precision, skill, and courage. To succeed requires an intuitive relationship between horse and rider. And that's exactly the kind of relationship Brittany Holland has with her horse, Red. Red knows me real well, and he minds what I tell him to do. I like Red a whole bunch. It's important for Brittany to ride a horse that really pays attention, who can focus intently on the course, because Brittany has been legally blind since birth. I was born without my macula, which, which lets you see color and detail. And like the doctors told my mom that I was totally blind. Brittany's mother, Susan, remembers when she first realized that something was different about her new baby. The doctor looked in her eyes and said um, her eyes did not develop. It was probably one of the darkest days of our lives. It took us a year to accept it. We, we took her to five doctors, just thinking surely that the doctors didn't understand. Surely the doctors didn't diagnose her condition properly. Um, after five doctors, we began to realize that what they were telling us was how it was going to be. Brittany's not too much of a horse lady. Well, goodness gracious, Mama, we just turned one years old. Determined to give Brittany as normal a life as possible, Susan included her in the family's activities, many of which involved horses. I used to ride with my mom and my dad, and like sometimes they would let me hold on to their reins and help them, and it made me feel really, really good. At the age of four, Brittany still needed her mom's help to ride. But when they were in the ring with the horses, Brittany was starting to feel a sense of freedom that sometimes made everyone forget her condition. She was in front of me, and her sister Haley was riding out in front of us. And I said, oh, look at Haley. Look at her, look at her loping. And she said, Mama, I can't see Haley. And I, I just realized, and, and she said, Mom, will I ever be able to see Haley? And I had to tell her, you know, Brittany, 
you're not going to be able to see, but that's okay. You're still going to do great, great things. As Brittany got older, it became clear that she had some residual vision. Her left eye was just strong enough to make out faint shapes and colors, and it gave the family hope. We believe very strongly in God and feel like, you know, God, I don't know why my daughter is blind or how we're going to go about raising her, but I know that you will help us and you will bring the right people in our lives and you will help guide us. And the answer to a prayer is sometimes as simple as recognizing an opportunity when it's presented to you. We love to barrel race. I barrel race, Haley barrel races, uh, and so Brittany wanted to barrel race. So when she was four years old, um, a friend of ours had a horse, very old, but knew the pattern. And knowing the pattern was enough to begin taking part in the family's favorite sport all on her own. Doc Thunderstorm was a gentle old horse who knew his way around the barrels and was willing to take little Brittany along for the ride. I was kind of nervous the first time I got on the horse, but then after I rode for a while, I, um, it didn't make me nervous anymore. Brent, where are you going with your horse? Brittany quickly outgrew the gentle but somewhat sedate old Doc. She wanted someone a little faster, so she moved on to her first serious barrel racer, Mr. Ed. Mr. Ed was a wonderful horse. He, he would lope, he would trot, he would mind her. She really enjoyed Mr. Ed. For any newcomers here, this little girl is legally blind. On Mr. Ed, Brittany became a real contender in the world of barrel racing. Go, Brittany! Brittany loved Mr. Ed, but eventually, as her confidence grew, she wanted to go even faster. That's when Red came in to pump things up a notch. Every time that I get a new horse, I'm getting faster and faster and faster. I need a faster horse. Brittany had not been on a horse this quick, this fast, and it did concern me. I think her very first barrel race on Red, when she came running 90 miles an hour to that first barrel, Please hang on, Brittany. She was running home, and you could tell her eyes were big because Red was really running hard. I said, Brittany, you were running too fast. And she said, wow, Mom, it was great. But as fast as Red is, and as scary as it sometimes gets, Brittany's confidence is keeping pace with the exhilaration of her ride. I didn't think she would go as fast as she goes now. But it didn't bother me because I knew if you have a gentle horse, the horse will take care of her. They're just close friends. Susan believes barrel racing has done more for Brittany than just teach her about horses. She has control of a 1,500-pound animal, and she is free. And I think that helps her spirit. I love going fast and being able to ride my horse and to compete against other people. And uh, I don't care if I get a fast time or a low time. It doesn't really matter to me. Just riding horses is fun to me. And that's what I enjoy doing. <coughs> Haley, are you moved? We allow Brittany to be free and to, to set her own boundaries, her own limitations. And because of that, I do think she tries more and does more. One of Brittany's special qualities is her affinity for animals of all kinds. When I go to the back barns, I'll call the kittens with my meow. And then, like, when they all come to me, I'll pet on them and love on them and then I'll go get their food and feed them. Brittany loves to spend time in the barn with her big sister, Haley, and their menagerie of friendly barn cats. Brittany has such a love for animals, and they know and they feel that love. Brittany's relationship with her beloved animals has helped her realize the power she has always had deep within. I want to be 
a veterinarian assistant, and a barrel racer. The struggles Brittany has to go through of not seeing will not hurt her, but will make her a stronger person. I know for a fact she's going to do greater things being blind than she ever would have if she had pure vision. We believe that she sees with her heart. Next on Animal Miracles. After three days without food or water, a young family stranded in the remote Rocky Mountains clings to the hope that someone will find them. The miraculous story of four desperate lives and one incredible dog. When we return. Nearly every breed of dog we see today is genetically descended from the wolf. This close connection to such wild ancestors is a constant source of fascination for dog owners everywhere. When it comes to search and rescue dogs, this instinctive familiarity with the forests and mountains is the cornerstone of their remarkable abilities to track, protect, and save countless humans in need. Grizz was Gord Burns' faithful partner for nine of the 20 years that he served with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. In their years together, Gord and Grizz worked on nearly 3,000 cases, but one case stands out from all the others. It all started at three in the morning, near the small mountain town of Yak on the Canada-US border. An incoherent man has stumbled into a farmhouse. Uh -huh saying that he left his family in the mountains. Uh, they've been out for three nights. Um, it's very cold and snowy and uh, feels that his daughter perished the night before. As a police officer, you get skeptical periodically. And, and my initial thought was, being this was so close to the American border, we have a border jumper here. Grizz didn't mind the early wake up call. As usual, he was excited and ready to work. I think they can almost hear the, hear the phone out in the kennel and they, well, we're going, we're doing something. Gord Burns' initial skepticism turned to concern as he received more information. I thought, uh oh, we do have a serious, serious problem here. The man claimed that his wife and three children were still lost somewhere in the mountains. Three days of inexperienced uh, Mountain winter camping, to me, indicated there's probably going to be some, some serious injuries, if not fatalities, with this family. Grizz is trained to follow uh, human scent along the ground, uh, the, the exact path where the person walks. Grizz had to follow the man's track back, a scent that got weaker and weaker. He was working in reverse, which is rare. The dog was able to distinguish it. Well, you know, we don't normally do it this way, but I guess this is, this is what we want to do this time, and this is where they, they're still able to think for themselves. But Grizz was on track and pushed on, on what appeared to be an impossible trail. We just started to break into the snow line and uh, started up the canyon and came to a waterfall. And, and Grizz tried to scramble up, couldn't make it. I, I couldn't fathom how a person could have could have survived coming down that. There's still times we, as humans, think, oh, we're much smarter than that dog. And dogs are wrong there. They, you know, a, a human could have never come down that path. Grizz had never let Gord down before. He trusted his instincts more than his own. He's been right on all his, these years of service to date, and, uh, and that's got to be where it is. We had to go quite a ways around to get to the top of it. and. Uh, and got there, and sure enough, here was the trail again. I like to think he looked over his shoulder and said, told you so. Back on track, Gord put Grizz on the leash. Uh, the dog is telling us a story as we move across the ground. And, uh, and you can feel by the tension on the line when the dog's on the track or when he loses the track. 
It was now daylight and Gord was encouraged by visual clues. Grizz picked up the track again. We started to follow it up the creek. I had to let the dog off, off the leash. I got over at this rock and log area, and there was Grizz uh, with the, the first two victims, uh, the 11 year old and, and the mom. Without a moment's hesitation, Grizz went straight to the little girl and warmed her with his body. Grizz sensed that they were, were, were in trouble, um, and he responded by, I guess, the, the best thought he could is trying to, trying to get them to respond. You know, he could sense that they, there, there wasn't a lot of life left in there. And Esther, the, the, the 11-year-old, was unconscious, not responding at all. I still realized there were two missing, but this was the youngest one, so I was really happy to see that she was still alive. Gord built a fire, wrapped the two in survival blankets, and gave them hot tea. But the two older children, who had become separated, were still missing. It was time for Grizz to go back to work. It's hard sometimes because a dog feels, I've done my job, you know, where are we going now? By now, the track was so strong, Grizz seemed driven. And then the other two are found, cold but alive. Grizz led us back up the creek another half a kilometer or so and found uh, the 17-year-old Edis and 19-year-old Yan in a much better shape. As he reunited the family, Gord wondered again about their mysterious circumstances. I think these folks, being that they were from Europe, didn't realize the vastness of Canada and didn't realize that we go for hundreds of kilometers without civilization in the mountains. And this is part of what led them to the difficulties they got into. Grizz wasn't worried about the whys and wherefores. Cozying up around the fire seemed like a fine reward. The fire provides some comfort, but the ordeal wasn't over yet. It was impossible to take them out over land. I was, was concerned about uh, the young 11-year-old. I wanted her in the hospital as quick as possible. As soon as everyone was safely aboard, they were choppered out to hospital, where they were treated for exposure. Once everything that sort of settles down, you're, you're interrogating them somewhat to find out exactly what was going on. But before they could be questioned further, once again, they disappeared. Gord did not hear from them again until seven years later. This family shows up at the door. <laughs> you know, lots of hugs and hello, and walks inside, and, and uh, the little girl uh, wants to see Grizz. Uh, you can't put it into words, that, that connection. And, and she gave me a hug and gave Grizz a hug and said, well, we had to come back and thank you for what you did for us. And they uh, spent about an hour with us, we're out the door, and we're gone. It was a miracle for those folks, for Grizz to find him, that's for sure. Who knows where they are in the world at the moment. When we return, a zookeeper is found dead in the cage of 10,000 pound sissy, and she's branded a danger to humans. The remarkable act that saves her when Animal Miracles continues. Did you know that elephants once roamed North America just as they do today in Africa and Asia? Most of us will never see these largest of all land mammals in the wild. But in a growing number of sanctuaries, we can watch and study elephants up close. 
Trainers and naturalists are witnessing remarkable relationships between these massive animals, relationships which inspire and mystify human observers. The famous poet John Donne once wrote, nature's great masterpiece, an elephant, the only harmless great thing, the giant of beasts. Near Hohenwald, Tennessee, seven majestic female Asian elephants are free to roam 200 acres of green pastures. The elephant sanctuary provides a haven for old, sick, and needy elephants. Carol Buckley is the director of the Elephant Sanctuary and has worked with elephants most of her life. Our philosophy is very different than most zoos and definitely different than circuses. We strongly are opposed to dominating the elephant because we feel that creates aggressive and neurotic behavior in elephants. We don't operate as a human within the elephant element. We are acting like an elephant. We are trying to become an individual in the herd situation so that we are safe within the herd. So it's, it's different than expecting an elephant to learn the rules of human. We're learning the rules of elephants. In North America, most captive elephants are housed in small, confined spaces, chained for up to 18 hours a day, dominated and sometimes brutalized by keepers. I don't know of any situation in captivity where elephants are dominated where they are not abused on some level. Because to dominate an elephant it is exactly what it means. You make it do what you want it to do. And there will be people who will say, oh, but these elephants love to perform. And the truth is that they have no choice. Elephants are highly social and intelligent individuals. In the wild, they live in family groupings or herds. They are constantly interacting with each other, expressing a complex variety of emotions, including compassion and humor. Scott Blaze is co-director at the Elephant Sanctuary. He spends every day with the elephants. They would be with all their aunts and grandma and cousins and sisters and um, all the females are just in a really tight, close-knit group and they stay there for the entirety of their lives. The Elephant Sanctuary's most fundamental beliefs were about to be tested with the arrival of Sissy, an elephant branded as extremely dangerous. Her facility was too small. And so, like any individual, there's a time that you need your own space. And for Sissy, she didn't get that. So what she would do is, when people would keep petting her and she wanted them to leave, she would throw her trunk out at them, and of course then they would leave. So now this becomes a habit, because it works. And because of that, she was labeled as an aggressive elephant. Then one day, a terrible accident. Sissy's keeper was found dead, and she was immediately called a killer. And everyone in the zoo knew that you don't push Sissy to go in the barn because she was very afraid to be forced into her barn. A keeper went in to put her in her barn, and she got scared, and she spun away and smashed him, which really would have been an accident. It would have been her fleeing. They found fresh wounds and blood in her shoulder, and in his hand was a switchblade knife. And so they, of course, assumed that they were, he was trying to get her in the barn and that he was using this as a tool. Sissy, now labeled a killer, was transferred to another zoo where she suffered terrible beatings from zookeepers and rejection from the other two elephants. I went to the zoo to see Sissy. And what I saw was an elephant that was quite thin and Sissy really um, wanted to be with the other elephants, and so you'd see her move towards them, and then there'd be a gesture from one of the elephants, and she'd move away. And I thought, that is so sad. So Carol brought Sissy to the elephant sanctuary in Tennessee. From the moment she arrived, she was just an absolute marshmallow. Whenever I come around her and I'm gonna pet her, she stands real still and makes sure that she doesn't shift. She's so careful and she's so cooperative. And she, of all the elephants I've ever met, needs to be touched. When Sissy arrived, uh, she was a little lost, I think. She didn't know what to expect. She didn't understand what the new facility was. She didn't know what to expect from the other elephants. So there was a lot of confusion, a lot of questions. And also, probably the biggest fear that she had was the fear of the outside. 
Sissy was very fearful and it took her several days to even venture from the barn or to make the acquaintance of the other elephants. She wants to be with the other elephants. She doesn't know exactly how to do that. She doesn't understand all the elephant language yet. Eventually, Sissy began to settle in. Then, 17 months later, 34-year-old Winky arrived. She also had a checkered past. She spent her entire life in a small zoo in Wisconsin. Six months out of the year, Winky was kept inside her barn. 18 hours of the day of every day inside, she was on chains. So she had six hours of the day that she was off chains, that if she was lucky, she was outside. Now, she is the most hyperactive individual I've ever met. And I'm not surprised that she hurt people. Winky spent the first two weeks inside as she was too afraid to go outside. And I think by Sissy watching this, she realized how far she had come. Winky's behavior was too aggressive for the other elephants, but Sissy saw her in a different light. Winky is really very fearful. You know, she puts on the tough guy front, she acts like everything's fine, and she's not afraid of anything. And Sissy saw right through that. Each morning, the barn doors would open, but Winky would hang back. I think that uh, Sissy did try to connect with Winky and try to lead Winky outside and show her that, you know, it really was okay. You know, there were several times that Sissy would go outside, but she wouldn't go real far. She'd kind of hang out close to the door and kind of wait for Winky to come out also. Winky would act like she's going to go all the way outside. She'd take three or four steps out, and then she'd come back in. Sissy was always there waiting patiently for Winky to build up her confidence. One day came and she made it all the way out. She followed Sissy all the way. From there, I think Winky just started building more confidence that it really is okay out here. The two elephants were becoming inseparable. Everywhere Sissy goes, Winky follows, and they went all over the property. They were checking everything out and that was great for both of them. For Sissy and Winky, raised in captivity, having no family connection, and two very different personalities, their unlikely friendship has opened the door to a brighter world. When you do see two elephants that are able to bond, it is wonderful. Winky is an amazing individual, and her gift is her energy. And in Sissy's case, I really believe it's her love, which is her gift. To the elephants. If you need her, she'll be there for you. There is no greater joy than to have an elephant accept you as a friend. There may be no greater miracle than the transformation of these gentle giants who were once branded as killers. A transformation made possible by the guardians at the elephant sanctuary and by the love and compassion of their own kind. Every year, millions of dogs are taken to shelters across North America. Dogs like my friend Logan here. If you're able to bring a dog or a cat into your family, visit your local Humane Society or animal shelter. You'll be glad you did. I'm Alan Thicke, and uh, well, we'll see you next time with more miraculous stories. Right? <laughs> <laughs>